And listen, when you can't handle problems that come upon you, your spirit gets depressed. And if your spirit gets depressed, an unclean spirit or a demon will come and live inside your body. Warm kingdom greetings. Thank you very much for being part of our family this morning and for joining us in our morning service. I pray that all of you, despite whatever the devil may be throwing at you, that you are resilient and you are standing strong. Sometimes the winds may blow and you may feel as if you're tipping over, but the Lord's strength is within you. Make no mistake. Be under no illusions that we are not living in a bubble. We are walking in a valley filled with dark angels. And because of that, you're going to have different calamities, different troubles and trials. And God is going to be the one to always restore you no matter what. Beloved, this morning, you know, I've been wanting you to be familiar with the trials, with the struggles of the early fathers, church fathers, the apostles, the disciples who walked spreading the gospel immediately after Jesus rose. And uh, I've taken you through most of the apostles and what they had to endure some were dragged by men and horses for distances, skins peeled off, some were beheaded, others were crucified, some were burnt at the stake. And so what these apostles and disciples had to go through was a tremendous ask on their humanity. And I, want you to, I wanted you to get a sense of, of what it costs so many for us to have the gospel today. And uh, spare thought for God's early soldiers. And compared to what, you know, problems we have now, it, is, it seems to be a, a, a drop in the ocean, uh, emotionally speaking, physically speaking. So, in, in lieu of sharing what they went through and their impact in the early world of Christianity. I wanted to share with you about an apostle called Jude. Um, we, we're going to talk about how he impacted, uh, especially in the Arab world in the early years. We're going to start by talking about a king. His name was King Abgar. And he wrote a letter to the Lord for the Lord to assist him with his illnesses. Now we're going to get into that reading. Just bear with me. Now I'm going to read you texts from a book called The Doctrine of Adai. Now the other name for Jude was Adai. And he's referred to that in the text we're going to read. This, the original text of the doctrine of Adai is contained in the Syriac Bible from Syria. That's because he was the evangelist in that area. And the record of his works were kept in a church and in a palace in that section of the world. Uh, in a place called Edessa. So let us read a few paragraphs and parts of this book, if you don't mind. Follow with me. The letter of King Abgar, the son of King Ma'anu, and at what time he sent it to our Lord at Jerusalem, and at what time Adai the apostle came to him at Edessa, 
and what he spake in the gospel of his preaching and what he said and commanded when he went forth from this world to those who had received from him the hand of the priesthood now let me set the platform for who this man was uh, apostle adai is also called you look at his name in in the bible it's called uh the dios or jude some say he was the half brother of jesus some say he was part of the 72 apostles as referred to in this book now when he before he was sent there the king uh, abgar had a problem with rep- leprosy and uh, he once upon a time sent his trusted officials to take correspondence to um, to the second in charge of rome the deputy emperor the deputy emperor of rome was sabinus he was based in hebron now hebron today is that west bank in palestine that area where the the war is taking place but the king akbar was based in in edessa edessa is, uh, is today it's called urfa it's in turkey but uh, in those days the, the this city fell under syria not turkey but turkey took over that territory as the years went on so from the top if you're looking at the map from north he traveled down the the the, the officials traveled down through palestine to come to hebron because they carried official kingdom letters king abgar sent a report of his kingdom to the roman uh, deputy emperor sabinus now when they came through and they were returning back home they had to pass through jerusalem and there was some uh, people that were traveling from different parts of the world and they all you know met up on the on the travel path and the three officials that were sent by king abgar came across these men and upon talking to them they realized they were going to see a person called jesus who was doing great miracles in jerusalem so these three officials said if he's doing such great miracles maybe we can go and see what is this all about when they went into the city they saw jesus and they were watching the miracles that he was performing and they were amazed now one of the king's officials was the registrar the person you know who took down official records record keeper of that kingdom of akbar and so he began to write down all the miracles that he saw jesus doing and the words that jesus was speaking so he put it down on paper or papyrus and then they traveled back to the kingdom of edessa when they got there the documents were displayed to to the king and the king read about it what the registrar had written down and he was amazed and he was curious and he said listen i too want to go and see this man but there was a problem because if he traveled through a roman um uh, controlled area there would be problems politically so he was advised not to travel on his own so he sent the th- same three officials with a letter to give to jesus concerning his health and so when these records were taken to the palace they were uh, put in 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 the palace records and kept it is from these records that this document we reading from now originated it was the testimony of the registrar who recorded everything that happened in the life of jesus christ but it goes a little further than that let us continue to see the the leading up to all these events where 
the record keeper wrote down what he saw. When they went forth from him, they set out and came on the way towards Jerusalem. And they saw many men who came from a distance to see Christ. Because the fame of his wonderful deeds had gone forth to remote countries. So remember I mentioned to you there were men that was going to see Jesus and the miracles. And these three men that were officials of King Abgar met them on the way. And because the gospel of Jesus and the miracles had spread to many parts of the world. It goes on to say when Marihab, Shamshagram and Hanan. Now, now this was, these were the three officials but Hanan was the keeper of all the records. And Hanan the keeper of the archives saw the men. They also came with them to Jerusalem. When they entered Jerusalem they saw Christ. And they rejoiced with the multitudes who were joined to him. But they saw also the Jews who were standing in groups and were considering what they should do to him. For they were disturbed to see that a multitude of their people confessed him. And they were there in Jerusalem ten days. And Hanan, the keeper of the archives, wrote down everything which he saw that Christ did. Also, the rest of that done by him before they went hither. So as I mentioned to you that the king sent these three people back to take a letter to Jesus after he had heard everything about Jesus from the record keeper Hanan. We'll read the letter that Akbar the king wrote to Jesus. Akbar ruler of Edessa to Jesus the good physician who has appeared in the country of Jerusalem greeting. I have heard the reports of you and of your cures as performed by you without medicines or herbs. For it is said that you make the blind to see and the lame to walk, that you cleanse lepers and cast out impure spirits and demons and that you heal those afflicted with lingering disease and raise the dead. Let me stop there for a moment. Firstly, this testimony is coming from somebody who was not a Jew, who wasn't originally following Jesus and he is witnessing how Jesus was doing all the miracles and the, this aspect of he was casting out impure spirits and the demons. Now this lays bare what I've been sharing with you over the many many years including the books that I have written. Where I told you that besides demons that possess people. They are what they call impure spirits or disembodied spirits. People who have died, their spirits roam in the world of Hades. And through witchcraft and other means, they are uh, imposed upon to enter a human body. So a human being can be affected by impure dead spirits and demons. Just bear that in mind. And having heard all these things, the letter continues, concerning you, I have concluded that one of two things must be true. Either you are God and having come down from heaven you do these things or else who does these things are the son of God. I have therefore written to you to ask you if you could take the trouble to come to me and heal all the ill which I suffer. 
For I have heard that the Jews are murmuring against you and are plotting to injure you. But I have a very small yet noble city which is great enough for us both. Wow. This unbelieving king who is now believing and who is testifying about who Jesus is, the son of God or God himself. Listen, this is amazing. I, I need you to know how, how amazing this is just by reading about the miracles from Hanan, but hearing about it from the three officials, he is led to believe in who Jesus is. Not only that, he warns Jesus about the impending attack that his own Jewish people have a, a plan, a plotting against him. Now, I, I don't know whether I've, I've, I've got it down here as we go forward, but, but Jesus, but, but King Akbar was actually angry. He, he said, you know, I wish I could take an army and go and, you know, kill these people. You know, after Jesus died, he wanted to do that. That's how upset he was. And so this man's uh, plea to Jesus was brought to Jesus by these three officials. Let's take up the reading. He wrote a letter and sent it to Christ by the hand of Hanan, the keeper of the archives, he went forth from Odessa on the 14th day of Adar and entered Jerusalem on the 12th day of Nisan, on the 4th day of the week, Wednesday, and he found Christ at the house of Gamalil, the chief priests of the Jews. Now we remember we preached about Gamalil, faithful servant of God. Jesus was sitting with this high priest in his house where the three officials took the king's letter and met him. I remember the king when he sent this letter Jesus was touched because he identified who Jesus was and he even offered Jesus safety to come and live there in the city uh, because he knew that his own people were trying to kill him. So Jesus gave a reply in writing to, the, to King Akbar and this is what Jesus says, Blessed are you who has believed in me without having seen me for it is written concerning me that they who have seen me will not believe in me and that they who have not seen me will believe and be saved but in regard to what you have written to me that I should come to you it is necessary for me to fulfill all things here for which I have been sent. And after I have fulfilled them, thus to be taken up again to him that sent me. But after I have been taken up, I will send to you one of my disciples, that he may heal your disease and give life to you and yours. So Jesus, quite plainly, is telling him, Listen respectfully king, I cannot come to you because I have a particular mission to fulfill. God has sent me to do something which I must do but immediately after I have fulfilled all these things, I am going to die and I am going to rise up and go to be with my father. But don't be alarmed because at the time when I go up, I am going to send my disciple to you so that he can sort the problems that you have. I want to stop there for a moment and ask you to ponder this. That Jesus heard a cry from a man who was willing to give him a place of refuge, who believed in him and yet not seen him. This is similar to a prayer that you and I have sometimes. Lord, we believe in you. We believe you are the son of God. Sometimes we tend to believe that Jesus will not answer. At that moment he told the king, I can't help you. But if you are patient, 
when I die and rise, I will send. So what I'm saying to you is that when your plea comes from a belief in who he is and his ability to help you through whatever you're going through, God will answer you. But if you have, you know, there is no record that King Abgar went to anybody for assistance. He waited upon the word of Jesus Christ alone. I want you to bear that in mind for a moment. There is nothing more certain that if you send a prayer to the Lord and you believe in him, he will answer you even as he did a person who was not yet said to be a true believer, not even a Jew. He did that for the centurion as well. He healed the centurion's son despite not him not being a Jew. So, you know, whoever you are listening to me right now, if there is enough belief in Jesus alone, who he is, and you cry to him, with the earnestness of your heart. And you know out of his. He didn't know how else to help Jesus. But he reported to Jesus what he heard people speaking about him. That they are plotting to kill him. And he says Lord for your kingdom. For you to be safe. For your work on earth to be safe. I am prepared to house you. I am prepared to offer you a place of refuge. And, then, and you'll see his generosity as we go a little further now when Hanan the keeper of the records listened to what Jesus was saying he there's a few things that happened since so let's read what the what the scripture says when Hanan the keeper of the archives saw that Jesus spake thus unto him by virtue of being the king's painter he took and painted a likeness of Jesus with choice paints and brought with him to Akbar the king, his master. And when Akbar the king saw the likeness, he received it with great joy and placed it with great honor in one of his palatial houses. This painting today is referred to as the mandolin or the image of Edessa and you'll see you know during the centuries that passed it was last seen I think it was 1000 AD somewhere around there when it seemed to have disappeared during the French Revolution uh, stolen if I could say but Hanan drew the image of Jesus and even that the king treasured. Now reading again. After that Christ had ascended to heaven. Jude, Judas Thomas. That's the apostle Thomas that we read went to India. Sent to Abgar Adai the apostle. Who was one of the 72 apostles. Adai said to him. Because that from the beginning thou didst believe in him who sent me to thee, therefore have I been sent to thee. And if thou believest in him, everything in which thou dost believe, thou shalt receive. Akbar said to him, So have I believed in him, that with respect to those Jews who crucified him, I desire to take with me an army and to go and destroy them. There it is. But because the kingdom belongs to the Romans, I was restrained by the covenant of peace, which was confirmed by me with our Lord, the Emperor Tiberius, like my forefathers. So there was a peace treaty that was signed between King of Edessa and the Roman Empire that he wouldn't take troops or start any kind of revolt inside Roman territory. So the king of Edessa, Abgar, could not, was restrained from taking an army to avenge the death of Jesus. 
But as you have read Adai then as being instructed by the Apostle Thomas, keeping the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, he went to Edessa, eventually met the king and addressed the king as what we have read. Adai said to him, that's now Jude, our Lord has fulfilled the will of his father. And when he has completed the will of his parent, he was taken up to his father and sat with him in glory, with whom he was from eternity. Abgar said to him, I also believe in him and his father. Adai said to him, Because that thou so believest, I will place my hand on thee in the name of him in whom thou believest. And at that moment that he placed his hand upon him, he was cured of the plague of the disease which he had had for a long time. So, not only did Abgar get healed, but Jude was used to touch and heal many officials and princes and other people in that area. So, you know, the king was overjoyed. He was so excited that, you know, about his healing and, and, and having touched the hem of God's garment. He said to Adai, Jude, he said, tell me more about Jesus. I really want to know more about God, about what he's done, what he said. Can you please tell us, you walked with him, Adai. Tell me more. So Adai said to him, I want you to gather the town folk, your city, and I'm going to address them. Let us read. Adai said to him, I will not keep silent from declaring this. For because of this, I was sent here to speak and to teach everyone who, like thee, is willing to believe. Tomorrow assemble for me all the city that I may sow in it the word of life by the preaching which I will preach before you concerning the coming of Christ. And he said to him, because that the gate of life is straight and the way of truth is narrow, therefore few are the believers of truth. And in the power of unbelief is Satan's recreation. Because of this, there are many liars who cause to err those who look on. Listen to me. Adai took in the first instance to tell the king. He said, King, listen. The first thing I need to tell you, you know, get all the townspeople, but the first thing I need to tell you about the coming, to prepare you for the coming of Christ is to warn you about this one very important issue. I need to instill in the people the word of life. And the reason I need to do that from the very outset, the first and most important thing to tell you, is that in and amongst now you being a Christian, when you accept, there are many who will believe. But that part to believe is so narrow. He says, Few will find it. He says the reason for that is because of Satan's recreation. What does that mean? It means that Satan will plant liars inside of those who believe. And these liars will mislead the Christians, redirect the Christians. This is the recreation. This is the game Satan plays. This is what he's going to do. So listen, before I can tell you about Jesus, before I can tell you anything, King, I need to gather the townspeople, 
for those who start to believe in Christ the first warning i must give them is that the road is narrow to the truth so when you accept Christ king you and whoever in the city bear this in mind inside of you who believe there's going to come liars who are going to tell you things that are false that will mislead that will seek to deceive and rope you in to satan's trap and away from the true way he says the way of truth is narrow so listen i, I don't want to spend uh, any unnecessary time talking about an issue but this is paramount because many times in my pastoral life i hear as long as people as long as they are christians as long as it's a it's a place called a church it doesn't matter where i go to fellowship as long as it's church and they are in jesus christ it's okay you know there are many and i want you to put your wisdom caps on cuz i'll tell you why this wisdom is so important you know there's over the over the many many years when i try to tell people about how narrow this truth is it seems like it goes this side and it comes out that side there are people who suffer greatly because they have strayed from the truth because they embrace the teachings of liars they get sick in their body many get possessed many can't find the way out of problems because they haven't got the way of truth invested in them in in that rightful way so they come to me when i pray for them before that you know the first thing i ask people do you go to church they'll tell me some of them a lot of them yes pastor we go and then i ask them did your pastor not pray with you yes pastor but i think something is interfering with me something is wrong with me you need to pray and check it might be spirits sometimes when they tell me the symptoms i tell them it's spirits so i ask them did your pastor pray they say yes pastor but he can't do anything because he's not gifted in that area do you know when you shepherd a, when you shepherd people you must be equipped to shepherd you cannot take shepherdship you cannot take the mantle and not be able to feed the sheep so if you can't feed protect your sheep it means that you going to allow that sheep to go and graze in other pastures to satisfy and then these same people over the years if i pray and take out whatever is there they say we only coming for the prayer and and they go back and sit where the shepherd is unable to sort the problem now i want you to put wisdom caps on so that you can understand what i am trying to say if church is not just a place where jesus christ's name is said from the pulpit no no that's the first thing adai is teaching the king he says let's read that again there are many liars 
who cause to err those who look on so when you say you are a christian church you may not be exempt that satan will will try to have a game play in your ministry recreation taking place so there will be changing of doctrines to believe in this and that and that will cause people to err and that will bring in spirits that will settle into people so i spoke some about this last week but we're going to get into some things a little later we'll continue the reading from because of this there are many liars who cause to err those who look on for except that there is a good end for faithful men our lord had not descended from heaven and come to the birth and to the suffering of death and also he had not sent us to be his preachers and evangelist so god is saying while satan is doing all these things jesus would not have taken the time to send us if they were not faithful men in and amongst those who the devil wants to deceive so because of faithful people out there god is sending people like myself and there may be many who are trying to bring people back to the narrow path of the truth so that these righteous people who god says it is for your sake that god is sending the message so it continues those things which we saw and heard from him which he did and taught we confidently preach before all men for we would not do any wrong with respect to the truth of his gospel and not these things only but also those things which were done in his name after his ascension we show and we preach so here again i must remind you that everything that takes place in your church adai jude who was one of the 72 apostles if not one of the 12 main apostles he is telling this king that everything we saw with our eyes jesus do we did if we didn't see jesus doing it we don't do it that's the bottom line of his so he's saying this what we've seen what we've heard is what we preach and what we teach nothing more nothing less so before he can even address the city he's telling the king this is my message so the king says i and manu my son and augustina that's the king's mother and shalmat the queen and now wherever thou wishest build a church a house of assembly for those who have believed and shall believe in thy words and as commanded thee by thy lord minister thou at times with confidence and those who are teachers with thee of this gospel i am prepared to deliver to them large gifts that they may not have any other work but ministry everything also which is required by thee for the expenses of the house i will give thee without taking account so this king went out of his way he says adai choose wherever you want in this city i will build the church in the place you say i will pay the salaries of all the ministers who you choose to minister there to the people to my city and i will not ask you for anything back just do the will of god wow what a, 
uh, what a heart this man had. He was so grateful to be called a child of God. And all he wanted was for the message of God to be taught, to be preached, and for souls to be saved. This is all he taught. That's all was on his mind. So, I want you to know who Jesus is now. Jesus being who he is, in his heart, he knew in advance what impact this king will have in the Syrian world. And he knew that because of this king, he will be able to plant a church in Syria. Although now today that region is Turkey. But Jesus was moved because he knew the impact, the measure of impact that this king is going to have in his kingdom. And he responded because he knew that if he did what he did, the kingdom of God will be richer because of Jesus' actions. So listen, I want to make sure you understand this. Everything God does, how small or how big, everything is geared towards his kingdom. He does nothing. He sees the picture about his kingdom he sees it in advance and walks towards it. Knowing what the king will do for his kingdom, he sent his apostle to help the king. Knowing that the king will enrich his kingdom. Because of the king's influence, thousands and thousands of souls came to Jesus. And so, when you live your life independent of Christ in other words if your living does not impact or benefit the kingdom of God in any way there is no reason that God will impact or interfere in your life so ask yourself this much in what way is my life Enriching God's kingdom so that he can hear my prayer and help me through what I'm going through. See, when you have a saw in your hand, plasters won't take the saw away. When you have sickness in your body, you can't treat the symptoms. You got to find the root cause of what is my impact. You know, a simple thing like this. We share the gospel so that somewhere, someone, one little tone in my voice, syllable in my word, can touch someone's soul somewhere on a different part of this planet so that they get convicted and give their lives to Jesus. And all I ask is for someone to take the time to share this with at least one person. We have no idea the plan of God. And how often is it that as soon as we listen and feed ourselves with this sermon, with this message, enrich us in whatever way, we shut off and what, where that gospel goes and who else it reaches, it's none of our business. And you wonder why God doesn't impact your life because it has no relevance to his kingdom. And I don't like to go to the financial issues because God's kingdom is never about that. It's about how far, how fast, 
how many souls can be saved with what the contributions that come into his kingdom are. Without those contributions, this message that I am preaching would not be possible for it to go out. I would not have the capacity to do what I do without those funds. So as much as we don't want to talk about it, those are essential things for making the kingdom progress. Otherwise, I'll have to find something else to do to sustain myself and my home. So if there is anything that you find that, listen, I'm, I'm doing everything, Lord, to assist in your kingdom. Hear my cry. Listen to me. God will never ever let you down. Jesus might say, wait a while, while I send somebody to you. He might say all kinds of things, but one thing is for sure, he will hear you. So when you are suffering with that sore, ask yourself, am I in any way impacting God's kingdom? Am I doing anything to further his agenda on this earth because listen to God the only important thing is your soul to God nothing else matters your soul being with him after you die your spirit being with him is the most important thing so impacting his kingdom means impacting his ability to save souls all over this world bear that you know in the at the back of your mind have that so when prayers are not really getting answered your prayers check if there's a weakness in your service to his kingdom in any way let us go forward reading from page 52 of this excerpt and all who believed in Christ are dying received and baptized them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now, there's water baptism and there's what they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, Christians, especially in these contemporary days, they have no idea what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. When people say, I haven't, I got baptized in water, but I haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they have no idea what that means because they think that when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit means that you must start to babble. You must start to talk in indistinguishable language babbling what they call tongues now if somebody doesn't speak in those babbling tongues it means that they haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit this is one of the lies that creep in and make people err from the truth don't ever think now let me ask you this firstly before I go any further when Jesus got baptized in water and he came up he then received what settled on him looked like a dove the Holy Spirit so he got a Holy Spirit baptism are you are you with me now after he got baptized does any scripture now I've read to you all the Apostles account even the infancy of James his brother everybody did they ever mention that he started to make ba 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 and talk all different languages in the water after he got baptized. Did they ever? He was normal and normal human being. He started to speak to them the language of the day, whether it was Hebrew, he was speaking Aramaic, or whether it was Greek. But he was talking where people could understand him. So there was no manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Falling, I mean, imagine Jesus get baptized and all of a sudden he passed out, fainted. What's happening to him? Oh, God is working on him. He would have drowned if he fell flat in the water after he got baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
if that is baptism. So when you say baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing fantastic manifestly you will see happening to a person. They're not going to shake all of a sudden. It, God, listen to me, God is a respecter of a person. He will never take over a human body and use that human body to shake. He respects the will of a man. That's why he says you must always be of sober mind. So let me recap quickly. There is a baptism of water for the cleansing of sins, a rebirth of sorts. And then there is the Holy Spirit. When all you have to do to receive the Holy Spirit is for you to believe in Christ as the Son of God. He came, He died, He rose. I believe that I'm going to be with you when I die, Lord, that you forgave me for my sins and I will live as righteously in your sight as possible. That is all you need to say. Even while you're sitting there, if you believe in Christ, Lord, give me the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a free gift that he gives to you. He gives it freely. It is your guarantee that you will go to heaven. So don't think because you can't speak in tongues, because you don't fall down, because you don't shake when the praise and worship is going on, you know, you don't go like this. Because you don't do all those things, the false teachers, liars come to tell you that you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so you start to earnestly do things and go to places where somebody can drop you, possess you, make you do those things. And so some people get despondent and discouraged because they're not receiving those what they call gifts now. So let me read to you in the book of Matthew. I indeed baptize you with water, John the Baptist says, unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, this fire is something that these false teachers today use very loosely and you have no they have no idea what that word means or meant in the time it was written john was telling them now fire is pyra in greek it means associated with burning especially at death in other words uh, you know when you crucify or uh, cremating people it, it was it's meant in that context where it's a refining fire sort of a fire that refines people in other words you go through a lot of events trials tribulation painful moments that seek to refine you to shape you to strengthen your character that's what John the Baptist meant even to the point when he was talking about Jesus. He will come and he will baptize you with fire, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now fire meant to the early apostles that when they look back at this scripture, they will now know what it meant because they went through a hell of a time. After they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were crucified upside down. They were beheaded. They were, all sorts of things took place to, the, to these poor souls. After that, people were burnt at the stake. So this baptism of the... So once you have the Holy Spirit in you, you become a target for the enemy. And that God uses that attack of the enemy to refine you as by fire. I'm going to read to you some of the things that Peter wrote. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. In this you greatly rejoice, though, though now for a little while, 
if need be, you have been grieved, grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he's warning the believers. He says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in within you seems to be the tool for refining you. It makes you, it changes your character. It builds you. It makes you um, strong on the inside that you can tolerate. You know, over the years, I've taught many, many people in my church. And I am proud in Christ that they are such resilient people that I shepherd that it astounds me even that despite the trials and the problems they go through they still are standing and you know what they many of them tell me pastor we tried and we try to deal with this on our own and that is what God is looking for so as gold you become purified so when John the Baptist was saying you're going to be baptized with Holy Spirit and fire and these blasphemers that stand on the stage and talk about there's a fire there's a fire the fire is coming upon you it's not that it's a pyre it's a different type of fire it's a trial and testing fire that is imposed upon a believer so the first thing that happens is that when you become a believer there there's a refinement that has to take place of your character i think you understand this you cannot go on living the way you were living, behaving and giving in to temptation and all those things. So when the Spirit of God comes in, if it truly is there, there's a, there's a refining process. And you've got to submit to it until God is finished with you. Now, what is the real gifts of the Spirit? When this Holy Spirit, how would you know the Spirit of God has come into you? Listen to what Isaiah says. It gives us a clue. The Spirit of Wisdom and understanding this is what the Holy Spirit is he's talking about Jesus and he's talking about now what the Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord that's reverence for God so when you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're about to do something that you know God is not happy with nobody has to tell you that there's a conviction inside of you, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. And the thing that stops you from doing it is the reverence for God or fear of God. You don't want to offend, you know, you, you revere God too much to offend Him. Doing what you, in your heart, know is wrong. That's because wisdom is in you. And that's because the fear of God is in you. And why? because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Without the Holy Spirit in you awakening your conscience, those things will, you will carry on doing the wrong. There will be no change in you. But if there's a change, these are the changes, wisdom, understanding. So if you're sitting in a place that can't solve a problem of simply as possession, it means, well, let me talk, tell you what that means. People with wisdom will figure that out. Understanding, counsel, you'll be able to receive and give counsel wisely. When the Spirit of God is in you, you'll be able to advise people on the right steps to take. You won't tell them the wrong things to please what their ears want to hear. And then you'll have might. The word that is fit for that word to be used in Hebrew is fortitude. That means having pain, but going ability to go through it. Fortitude. So when the Spirit of God lives in your body, inside of you, these are the qualities 
that are displayed not falling down drunk that's why people who say they claim to have the holy spirit really are very unwise sometimes if i talk to them plain english it's hard for them to understand so there's no understanding god says the wisdom of counsel which means knowledge counsel not they, they can't absorb information they they have no fortitude they get they get broken down crying complaining just their countenance shuts off from the light when they go through they just can't handle things and listen when you can't handle problems that come upon you your spirit gets depressed and if your spirit gets depressed an unclean spirit or a demon will come and live inside your body so a depressed person in my experience as a pastor 99% of the time will get possessed and if you don't have fortitude you will get possessed if you can't go through it gracefully handle problems gracefully without depressing your spirit you will get possessed so these are the signs that there is no spirit so falling down laughing getting drunk in the spirit talking in babbling words those are not the signs that's why i was trying to tell you those people who do all those things they don't have good qualities of character lots of them they behave they gossipers they do their nature doesn't tell you that nature of which i read of the holy spirit so don't go looking for those things if you really want to have the holy spirit you go searching for wisdom knowledge being of good counsel reverencing the lord fearing god those are the signs that you have the spirit of god within you so last week i told you what tongues was this week i'm expressly telling you what baptism of the holy spirit is and these people who were baptized in the name of the father son and the holy spirit that adai baptized the king he didn't babble because there was no need for him to talk in a different tongue he was living amongst his people so he spoke to his people there was no tongue there was no falling down it simply the man became smarter wiser so that's what i'm asking of you beloved when you think of being baptized in the holy spirit don't think there must be a supernatural manifestation of some sort you need to have a change of character fortitude through the problems i will push that's what i want to see emerge out of you let me pray with you father in the name of jesus christ as your children go through fire the fire of hardship of difficulty of pain i ask you through the power of the holy spirit which abides inside of them give them the fortitude let them be able and come out with grace cover them all with your blood in jesus name i pray amen have a beautiful day beloved listen if you're listening to me for the first time and i want you to subscribe to this channel then click on the notifications bell so that every week you'll be able to get a fresh sermon south african time 8 a.m and also you'll have access to all the other previous sermons watch them one by one to enrich your soul god bless you i'll see you next week